All right, I think it's 10 o'clock. So welcome everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. We're super happy to have you here today. Um, this morning we'll be studying, I think the three dimensions of eco-dharma with Lobsog Tempa, who is a Tibetan Buddhist translator, meditation instructor, cultivating emotional balance teacher, and a student of eco-dharma. He spent 10 years as a Tibetan Buddhist monastic, and he's joining us from London. And thank you for being here, Tempa. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a joy and a pleasure to be here. And I'm always trying to think not just of those of us present here right now uh, in real time across multiple time zones, but also of those who might be uh, enjoying this meeting by means of a recording, which happens to me my, uh, to me a lot, uh, happens in my own practice a lot, where I would be watching something recorded ages ago, years ago, and still finding freshness and value in that. So hopefully there's be, there's going to be some benefit in what we're about to discuss, and we will start with a meditation. But before that, I'm just going to say a few words about the meditation itself. And after the meditation, I will uh, start talking about Echo Dharma proper by first introducing um, the term, talking about my own exposure to the system of practice and teachings, and then uh, just naming some ideas and some potential areas of exploration that would hopefully bring a certain level of well-being to ourselves and others. And so the meditation that we will do, uh, sometimes referred to as honoring the three lineages, uh, is, you could say, an expanded version of a Lend acknowledgement practice that I know many of the teachers who uh, are affiliated with the San Francisco Dharma Collective use quite a lot and with good reason. Um, but in this case, it's just an expanded version of that. Uh, even though I'm finding myself in London and the Lend acknowledgement for me would be probably going back to the Celtic roots of this land and thinking, wow, uh, more than a thousand years ago before the first Sakes and invasion. There were Celtic people living here, but that's been very, very long time ago. Outside of that, even though I could do that and will in this uh, ensuing practice, I would also benefit, and I do benefit from thinking not just about the historical heritage and the land heritage related to this piece of land that I'm finding myself on, named suburban London. Um, I also find benefit in thinking of another lineage, you could say, the spiritual lineage uh, to which I have been incredibly privileged to become um, a part of, uh, have been incredibly privileged to, be, to have been exposed to. And that is, in my own case, primarily the Indo-Tibetan contemplative lineage of practice. And uh, within that, as an interpreter and a translator, I've had the incredible fortune of meeting Incredible lamas, but also incredible practitioners of different genders, different generations, uh, different ethnic groups, because it's not just Tibetans, it's also Sherpas and Tamangs and Gurungs and many, many uh, Bhutanese and uh, Mongolians and Kalmyk people and Burak people, just many, many, many holders of this incredible tradition, which originally in turn came from India. And as a way of trying to counteract my own colonialism, which has been conditioned into me by the culture in which I was brought up, I am taking a moment in the practice that we're going to do to deeply bow to these incredibly generous people of multiple generations that have given me this knowledge so freely and so generously and so openly. So that's sort of the spiritual lineage. And each one of us can then think and will think of our own lineages of similar nature. We might have been exposed to many, we might have been primarily exposed to one or two or three, and we also might have spiritual lineages associated with uh, the land that we're living on or the culture in which we're abiding. And even though we're not actively exploring those, we know that they're there in the background of our own teaching, in the background of our own practice, in the background of our own thinking. And then the third lineage, which often gets neglected because there sometimes is a lot of negativity historically associated with it is the lineage of our own blood and bones, as Tibetans would say. So the lineage of our ancestry, our actual genetic ancestry, people who have procreated 
giving birth to the next generation and the next generation and then the next generation. And at a certain point, we appeared. Yes, for some of us, if we think about our ancestors in terms of the blood and bone transmission, um, there would be some perhaps darker points in history. And that's okay. We definitely do need to acknowledge that. And at a certain point, look at that very, very openly with a critical and open mind and with the understanding that we absolutely are in the position to now not repeat the past mistakes, mistakes uh, or horrible acts uh, that the previous generations of our ancestors perhaps have committed. But at the same time, we can be looking at the, this blood and bone ancestry from a different point of view and thinking, wow, there's probably a lot of resilience there, probably a lot of compassion and love and connection and familiar closeness and just so many different things that have allowed this blood lineage to survive and that have allowed for me to appear in this world in this specific embodiment and so without in any way ignoring the negative sides of that ancestry i can bow down i can bow down to the positive qualities to strengthen those and to rectify to alleviate to eliminate the negative ones, slowly, slowly, as Tibetans would say. And so these are the three lineages that we can think about in this meditation, and we will. The lineage of the land that we're finding ourselves on, and quite often that lineage would be connected to multiple peoples, multiple ethnic groups, and then also is definitely connected to non-human uh, species that have also occupied that land, that lived on that land, and uh, influenced that land. So that's the first lineage, the lineage of the land. Then our spiritual ancestry, which might be completely not connected for many of us to the religion in which our parents have been brought up, for example. And then actually the parental lineage of our blood and bone ancestry. And connecting to all of those as three sources of inspiration that can flow into us and inspire us to undertake ekodharma practice and work. So we'll do that as a brief meditation and then set a positive intention for this time that we're going to be sharing. So I would invite all of us if that's available to you, to find a comfortable stationary position for this meditation. It's going to be relatively brief. But we still might want to first, before going into the actual practice, do the preliminary stages of settling our body, speech, and mind in their natural states, as it's described in the Tibetan tradition. Or simply put, the preliminary stage of relaxing and releasing tension. And so one way to go about that is to bring our awareness down to the parts of the body that are currently in contact with the ground. And rest in the awareness of the tactile sensations there. The sensations of firmness, solidity, stability. Allowing these areas of our body to gradually release muscle tension and then allowing that wave of ease, that wave of relaxation to gradually spread out, spread out throughout the field of our body, engulfing our legs, our pelvic floor and our lower abdomen. And then expanding into our torso. into our shoulders, down the arms, the hands and the fingers,
And then from the tips of our fingers, returning back to the area of the shoulders. And to the face. Releasing muscle tension from the area of the face to whatever degree that is available to us. And then leaving our body in this equilibrium, in this state of relaxation, stillness, vigilance, Allowing our breath to move naturally without any attempts to control it, to manipulate it. And with our body resting naturally, with our breath moving in an uncontrived manner, using our mind to first connect to three sources of inspiration. lineages of inspiring force that can support us in our practice and exploration related to ekodharma and so first thinking about the land that we're currently finding ourselves on and are the multiple human and non-human generations that have occupied that land and for a large part of human history, protected it, tended to it, nourished it. The generations of people who were appreciative of this land and its reaches, and perhaps at some point in history even saw it as sacred. Thinking of those qualities and those people, and if we wish, inviting that inspiration into our heart. Inviting their wholesome attitudes. The inspiring examples. The commitment. so that we ourselves might also become appreciative of the land that we're on. Then thinking about the spiritual traditions to which we might have a connection. For some of us, it would be primarily one tradition, for some of us, many. But in either case, we can turn our mind towards multiple generations of practitioners who have explored the topic of genuine inner well-being through philosophy, meditation, contemplative practices, prayer. Being, as it is sometimes referred to, psychonauts, or those who go into the depths of human mind to explore the deepest potential that we might have. And once again, seeing the inspiring power of that, that commitment, that wisdom, that exploration, and the associated levels of compassion, love, and so forth. And inviting that inspiring power into our heart, if we wish. With a sense of gratitude for 
the holders of these teachings across multiple generations, regions, countries. And then, turning to the third lineage which has produced our body, it's the lineage of our genetic ancestry. Multiple generations of people surviving and in some cases flourishing. Starting with our parents and then going into the past for some of us across multiple ethnic groups, multiple continents, all the way back to the earliest humans, and then beyond that, non-human beings. And recognizing in this entire lineage of ancestry, some crucial qualities such as the ability to cooperate, Resilience, love, compassion, patience, everything that was necessary to survive. Without denying the negative acts or negative parts of human history, we can rest in an appreciation of the good qualities and invite them into our heart. We are not aliens to our families from this point of view because we have inherited a lot of the positive qualities. So may they guide and inspire us in our exploration of Ekodharma. We then release these thoughts and we generate an intention or motivation for this time that we're going to be spending together, simply asking ourselves, why am I here? What is it that is of interest to me here? What are some of my aspirations related to the topic? And once we have found something that is meaningful to us personally, we can just make two tiny adjustments to it. One is to make sure there's an aspiration for the benefit of many beings, not just one present in that motivation. And adjustment number two is to make sure we're aspiring for long-term well-being not just a few pleasant moments. And with that as the foundation for the ensuing process, we can bring our attention back to the body to notice its experiences. Then, very gently rock back and forth a little bit, introducing some movement to the body, moving our fingers, moving our facial muscles by smiling perhaps, stretching if we find that necessary and gradually concluding the practice.
Thank you. <clears throat> I think there is a lot of benefit in uh, connecting to our roots like this. And this practice does not simply, of course, come from uh, the idea of land acknowledgement. It is actually a practice that is very deeply embedded in the Indo-Tibetan contemplative tradition, because in many cases, before doing any other meditation or any other type of spiritual practice, especially the most elaborate spiritual practices that have to do with complex visualizations meant to transform our mind or elaborate ways of analyzing reality or profound and deceptively simple meditations on the true nature of our mind, all of those are very frequently preceded by a supplication addressing the lineage of transmission. And in some cases, those supplication prayers would include the name of each master that has preceded our generation. So it would be recalling these great yoginis, those great yogis, those great practitioners, and thinking of their qualities, special qualities for each one of them, and inviting those special qualities into our hearts so that we ourselves are inspired, because in a way, being the current generation of Jedi, we are the ones who have inherited these qualities. So it's our job now to manifest them in this world. So we better step up in a way. That's the idea there. And then we go into the actual practice and we meditate as necessary. So that's a very big part that has always been quite strongly present in the Tibetan tradition itself. But in some more westernized formats, uh, and in some, for example, Western Tibetan Buddhist organizations, Tibetan Buddhist organizations in the West, including in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and continental Europe, and so forth, that element has become somewhat lost, partly because unless we know the, these names and we know the bios of these people, we're not quite sure what exactly are we supposed to be inspired by. So we're a bit at a loss when we look at those lineages and prayers addressing them and all of that. And then we just check it out because, yeah, I don't know any of these people. So what's the point? But the psychological meaning is exactly as we have seen in the meditation itself. It's to make sure our heart is open to this, this inspiration. And then we turn this inspiration into something practical. So that's what we're going to look at. And I'm just going to activate some slides, hopefully without too many misprints, which seems to happen uh, a lot to me. Um, but hopefully there's going to be some benefit. And so the overall name for these three meetings is Three Planes of Ekodharma. And uh, we're going to obviously talk about these three planes and also talk about what Ekodharma can be described as. What's What's the idea behind this slightly strange uh, term and is it even appropriate to create a term like that is it not going to be uh, for example colonial which is a valid concern actually to explore and to discuss together so we're going to dwell on these and um, the meditation that we have just done as an introduction to our time together is this practice for connecting to the three lineages um, there's a guided recorded version of that uh, on my soundcloud that you can access at any point if you feel like repeating this practice. I find it quite powerful, especially for good Dharma stuff. And uh, at the end of that meditation, we took a moment to express our aspirations or generate certain understanding of why is it that we're here. And so if, if at any point during this class or meeting, uh, you want to share some of your aspirations related to Ekodharma in the chat, that would be very interesting actually, for me to look at, because I'm always curious about those things. And I think it very largely informs the entire process. So any aspirations and uh, points of interest that you might share in the chat will affect not just this class, but also the ensuing two meetings. So please feel free to share something there while we're going through um, the material. And the material is not here for me to just preach at the masses in any way. These are more points for reflection for all of us. And uh, even though I could my, describe myself, for example, as an instructor of the Cultivating Emotional Balance Program, or in some cases, a, a teacher and instructor of Buddhist meditation, when it comes to Ekodharma, I especially powerfully feel 
that I'm simply a student and the worst student in class for that matter. Uh, I'm just approaching this incredibly vast field of knowledge with a lot of awe, a lot of appreciation and a lot of curiosity. And I think there's lots to learn there for me uh, and maybe for all of us, which is why I think there's potentially some benefit in sharing some of the slides, you know, and what's written on them. And so it's in this process of learning that I have already absorbed a certain amount of ecological slash Dharma thinking from many of my primary mentors. And I have had the privilege of translating for you know, 30 plus, 40 plus different holders of the Tibetan, Indo-Tibetan tradition from all across the globe. They're not just Tibetan and they're also not just uh, from the global quote unquote West or from all over the place. Some of them are Tibetans, some of them are Sherpas, some of them are Americans, some of them are British, ethnically a wide variety of mixture of everything. And they've trained in different lineages and traditions but just to name some of the people who are very actively uh, exploring um, the topic of Ekodharma in their public talks, in their writing, in their articles, in their Dharma teachings, and so forth, are as well as the Dalai Lama has a few books on Ekodharma, actually, uh, or at least on the importance of environmental thinking in this day and age. Chukin Imer Rinpoche, who is an incredible holder of the tradition, and many people would be familiar with his brothers, Sokna Rinpoche, Mingyur Rinpoche, are quite well known uh, globally. Uh, they've done talks at the Global Economic Forum in Davos, uh, uh, brought there by our common friend, uh, Eve Ekman. They've done um, talks at Google and other locations of that nature and other companies and organizations of that nature. And Jack Nimer Rinpoche is the eldest uh, of the four brothers incredible teacher in his own uh, right, who um, has a lot of interesting thoughts and ideas with regards to Ekodharma. So I've learned a lot from him and I'm continuing to learn as I continue to have the privilege of interpreting some of his teachings into Russian. Garchin Rinpoche, who is an incredible yogi living currently in Arizona, originally from Tibet. He spent 20 years in a concentration camp practicing, or multiple years in concentration camp practicing, uh, becoming an even more accomplished yogi, and then eventually was released and became a very important teacher whose um, instructions on how to use love for attaining enlightenment are truly, truly unmatched in many ways. So in a way, king of yogis of our times, at least within the confines of the Tibetan tradition, very, very powerful teacher who also shares quite a lot of thoughts, ideas, inspiring points regarded to everything and anything related to the quote-unquote current agenda. So points like uh, the ongoing wars or the pandemic or the ecological crisis and so forth. He always shares something on those points, something related to the basic principles of Buddhist practice in general, and at the same time, something ex directly pertinent to those issues. Uh, and Tenzin Wangi Rinpoche, I would definitely mention as well, he is a master of Bun tradition, and Bun is the indigenous tradition of Tibet, which in its earlier forms existed even before Buddhism came in Tibet, uh, came to Tibet in the ninth century. Eventually, Bun tradition and Buddhist tradition kind of absorbed certain elements of each other and came to resemble each other quite uh, strongly in Tibet, uh, but Bun tradition still retains its own unique lineage of transmission, refers to its own unique lineage of transmission. It has its own practices uh, that are sometimes similar to the ones practiced in Tibetan Buddhism, sometimes unique. So uh, Tenzin Wangi Rinpoche is a holder of that uh, tra tradition and a very uh, active teacher in the Bay Area, amongst other places. Um, and he has a lot of teachings on connecting to the five natural elements, establishing a healthy connection to the natural world, establishing a healthy balance in our body and in our mind and so forth. So I know Eve has done a number, Eve Ekman has done a number of events with Tenzin Wangir and Pache, for example, um, panel meetings and so forth, and has received a lot of benefit from his books. And so have I. His books, his guided meditations are always a valuable source of information. And then there are, of course, multiple thinkers who comment on the connection between the Dharma uh, in general, and the environmental world 
in uh, the first among the first second and third generations of you could say um buddhist teachers buddhist practitioners and i so i would and amongst other names uh mention such luminaries as roshi joan halifax who many people would know for her work uh mostly centered in new mexico uh where uh the upaya community is based but She's recently just now come back uh, from Japan, where she was teaching uh, chaplaincy skills. And um, her activity spans the entire world, and a lot of it is connected to Ekadharma. And my primary meditation teacher and one of my root teachers, Dr. Alan Wallace, and that um, a powerhouse of Ekadharma, Joanna Macy, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who was one of the most important translators from Pali and a powerful thinker with regards to the issues of engaged Buddhism. Stephanie Kaza, who is a writer in the domain of Ekadharma and a student of Joanna Macy's. Gary Snyder, many people would know from the Bitnik generation, even though he doesn't like to be associated just with that, but also a powerful voice both in the world of poetry and environmental thinking, and to a certain degree, Buddhism as well. And David Loy, who I absolutely have to mention, not just in terms of his teaching activity overall, but because he is the author of the book named Echo Dharma, and it's a wonderful book. So if you ever want to explore that, that's uh, one of the sources to turn to with regards to all of this material. One thing to slowly read, to contemplate, to explore, many, many wonderful and interesting things there. So these are some of the sources of my thinking and my inspiration. I first and foremost have to say that when shaping this material, I tried to think more in terms of my Tibetan, Sherpa, Bhutanese, Mongolian teachers have transmitted to me, simply because everything coming from Western thinkers on the topic would be easily available to you in the form of books, talks, and so forth. Whereas some of these ideas shared by my Himalayan teachers or trans-Himalayan teachers would not be as easily available for reasons related to language and so forth. So a lot of the things that I will mention have come more from the first uh, group of teachers than from the second. And yet there's wonderful interplay, complementarity, dance with regards to the ideas of Ekadharma gradually spreading across the world. So uh, when I was in, becoming interested in Ekadharma, I sort of started noticing how uh, all the things that we are going to mention throughout these three meetings actually pervade the Indo-Tibetan tradition of Buddhism. And we could also say pervade all the different traditions of Buddhism, because you would also have very similar things noticeable when you adopt ecological thinking and you look at the practices and traditions and methods of the Theravada tradition, or the, speaking more broadly, the Pali tradition of Buddhism. Or when you look at, for example, Pure Land Buddhism, or the traditions of Chan, Zen, Sun, and Tian across four continents of respectively China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. So you would see this very rich ecological material across multiple sources. And in the Tibetan tradition itself, for example, you would see how Ekodharma and just environmental thinking is uh, directly related to teachings on ethical discipline and methods for cultivating an ethical practice. So something that's in Sanskrit called shila, ethical self-discipline, obviously directly connected to ekodharma because you can't, we would think, or that's a working hypothesis, right? You can't be fully successful in practicing ethical self-discipline is if you're continuously harming the planet and its systems, and especially if you're doing that deliberately or through very, very strong negligence. Okay, so that's one way of looking at it. But then we also see powerful strands of Ekudharma in the Buddhist teachings for cultivating samadhi or single-pointed concentration or mental gatheredness, mental cohesion. Because in those methods for cultivating a gathered, a stable, a focused state of mind, we see a lot of references, for example, to the five elements that the outer material world is made up of, made of. And we see a lot of explanations on how important it is to have a balanced and harmonious natural environment in order to succeed in the cultivation of samadhi. 
And we would have some practices in which we focus on one of the five elements uh, to develop concentration. Of course, if we want to focus on the element of water or the element of earth or the element of air, we would hopefully have them in as pure a form as possible in that water would not be too heavily polluted. The air would be breathable. The earth would still resemble what the earth originally was and so forth. So there's a direct correlation there and uh, a number of uh, practices related to, once again, this category would even have us using our imagination to invite the uh, living energy of the five elements or different combinations of five elements, for example, trees, herbs, and so forth. So there's a lot of that already, quite rich in terms of Ekadharma. Then, of course, uh, a very broad generalization, but not untrue, at least in my understanding, is to say the main teaching of the Buddha is the teaching on interdependence. And that generalization, however rough, uh, however coarse, has a lot of validity to it, because if we think about any other Buddhist teaching, it would be subsumed under that. So, for example, Buddhist teachings of love and compassion. Yeah, they can be subsumed under interdependence because love and compassion are sometimes described as the emotional or cognitive, to be more precise, related to desires and aspirations. Effulgence of truly understanding interconnectedness between us and other beings. So when we understand interconnectedness, the glow of that is loving kindness, compassion, and similar states. Okay, that works. Or, for example, Buddhist ideas on no self and emptiness. Um, so, essentially, Buddhist descriptions of the true nature of reality, how it is without a fixed, permanent, independent, unitary self, uh, and how all phenomena, then in Mahayana thinking, are devoid of inherent existence. Huh. That is all proven by thinking about interdependence okay that works and also karma obviously is a specific example of interdependence so wherever we look we could say yeah sort of more or less all of buddhist teachings are subsumed under this category but quite obviously then even a mundane level of understanding interdependence as in the environmental situation in this country is immediately affected by the environmental situation in that country right even on that level we're seeing ekudharma and we're seeing interdependence. So quite powerful as well, especially once we start truly training in that. In a, even on a completely secular level, when we start introducing a lot of exercises associated with understanding social, ecological, economic, and so forth, all these different types of interdependence, when we start introducing that to children or to adults, because even as adults, we can be very, at least, I'm speaking from personal experience, obviously, we can be very unaware when it comes to interdependence between our actions and the experiences of others, between our community and multiple other communities, our economic or environmental activity, and what happens to the rest of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Culturally, we're quite unaware of interdependence often. And so there's lots to be explored at any age. But if we were to teach, especially younger generations, to appreciate interdependence and to deeply contemplate that, we could perhaps change things for the better quite strongly. Okay. And then, um, so these are the three quintessential elements of Buddhist practice. Ethical self-discipline, developing mental gatheredness through samadhi, and then developing true understanding of reality or wisdom by means of especially analyzing interdependence, and by extension, emptiness, no self, and all those sorts of things. But then in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, you also have practices associated specifically with the five elements, earth, water, wind, fire, and space. And some of these practices are more medical or healing in nature. Some people would call them shamanic. Uh, and so these practices would then include methods that are related to invoking the healing or the balancing or the inspiring energy of a specific elemental property. That certainly exists. And obviously, it's quite ekodharma in nature, because when these teachings or methods are described and transmitted and explained, 
it is mentioned that well if we are trying to invite this energy and use it for our own benefit and connect to it it would be quite unreasonable of us to be polluting that element in the outside world at the same time so if we want to imbibe the healing energy of water we shouldn't be really polluting that water or we should avoid polluting that water as much as possible and fight for the sacredness of that water and the same with elements of earth and fire and wind and space of course just holds all of it but even space itself in these practices can be perceived and seen as a sacred foundational building block of reality and it's actually out of that feeling of sacredness of space that we start spurring a certain level of awe towards the other four elements and we try to connect to them and we also develop naturally or through concentrated effort a certain feeling that we should be protecting these four elements and their gross uh, of course expressions in the outside world so that would be like this shamanic level of inviting the energies working with them and so forth and sometimes that's done through archetypal imagery where the elements are represented uh, by five goddesses or five female buddhas and uh, hosts of different deities and so forth in some cases that's done through specific breathing exercises rather uh, in some cases it's just specific types of meditation. Sometimes, says, sometimes, sometimes there are mantra practices where each syllable would rip, correspond to one of the five elements. The psychological meaning is the same in that we're seeing the value of the five elements and the value of them being balanced amongst each other. And we try to connect to that and also offer protection to the five elements because they're sacred to us then. So that's a theme that is common to both Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism that came to Tibet from India originally, and the Tibetan Bunpa tradition, which has its roots perhaps in Central Asia, then found its way to Tibet and became the first indigenous tradition of Tibet uh, before then encountering Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. So these practices exist across both traditions, and we see other forms of practice actually in multiple lineages or wisdom traditions of this world. Then also within Tibetan Buddhism, there's a wonderful thing uh, that I'm excited about, but many people couldn't care less about probably, called Tara practice. And that is a system of meditation techniques related to, and once again, um, I've said this word before, an archetypal or symbolic expression of all the enlightened qualities in the form of a female Buddha named Tara, who has multiple forms uh, and those forms have multiple colors, different numbers of hands and heads and faces and legs and so forth. And they all represent different facets of our own basic goodness, which can be expressed by us through our individual behavior, through our communal behavior, and through our global behavior. Once again, these three planes of Ekodharma. So when we use these Tara practices or Tara meditations, we're trying to activate by meditating on Tara's image, mantra, wisdom, and all those sorts of things, we're trying to activate our basic goodness and these facets of our basic goodness, compassionate activity, compassionate listening, loving kindness, wisdom, decisive wisdom, gentle love, tough love, all those sorts of facets. We're trying to activate them first personally, and then, because Tara often appears in multiple forms at the same time, as 21 Taras, 108 Taras, and so forth, we do that on a communal level. If we're praying to 21 Taras, we're kind of getting the idea that they work best when they're all together, or 108 Taras, for example, and that inspires us to also equally manifest the qualities of our basic goodness together with others. And in the exploration of these methods, there's quite a lot of environmental imagery, symbolism, and there's a lot of there's a high level of importance that it's, that's attached to preserving natural environments. So, for example, in the, in the Tibetan tradition, um, the two most popular taras are white tara and green tara, two specific forms that we could meditate on. Uh, and if you've ever been to a museum of Tibetan Buddhist art, you would definitely have seen images of the two. White tara was sitting in a full lotus position, green tara whose right leg is a bit extended, while her left leg is tucked in, 
yeah and people think well yeah inspiring nice there's a female buddha and even though she's green or super super white snow white yeah that's cool nice to have a female buddha represented here in this museum so we think that but green tar in particular in um, a more elaborate description of where did that come from why is she green is described as tara of the acacia forest or kadiravani forest so she comes literally out of a forest and uh her pure land or the pure dimension in which she abides in between sending emanations across multiple universes in a very, I don't know, Star Wars fashion um, uh, or everything everywhere all at once fashion, uh, I should say. In between that, she's abiding in a pure land called the array of turquoise leaves. So she made a pure land for herself to be there and to teach beings in it, to give beings a space for practice. And she decorated with turquoise leaves, which probably means there are also trees there. Um, definitely means there are trees there because there are sometimes descriptions of the pure dimension. And if we are connecting to that practice, that kind of sends us a very clear message as well, even though this practice came from at least 1500 years ago, if not more. It sends us a clear message. Well, if we want to be like Tara, and that's the idea to embody her qualities, regardless of our current embodiment regardless of our gender identity and so forth we can if we like that system of practice we can absolutely train to become more and more embodying the qualities and the activities of tara so if we are into that we probably want to live in a world where there are still trees and turquoise leaves and many other types of leaves and where we can find shelter under those trees and leaves and so forth She's not Tara of post-apocalyptic Mad Max kind of universe. She's Tara who came from a Kadiravani or Acacia forest. Okay, that's inspiring. And that's sort of motivating, at least for me. Like, I don't know. But, but that's, that's sort of an, you could say, an environmental reading into the system of practice. But there's absolutely nothing novel about this type of reading because it says right there, porquoise leaves forest she came out of it she's green and her green color by the way uh, interestingly enough does not represent environmentalism it does not represent leaves she is green because in this elaborate system of symbolic thinking green color corresponds to the element of wind which means movement activity actively moving to accomplish something and green color also uh, represents the all accomplishing wisdom of a fully awakened mind. So the ability to get things done, to cut through fear, to accomplish goals, to actively benefit others and not just mull about it and uh, dream and never get things done. So that activity is represented by this green color that Tara as a archetypal or transhistoric uh, image embodies. Very environmentally friendly, uh, very environmentally conscious and quite powerful enough to inspire many people actually in uh, ecodharma in their ecodharma activity that's where some people find their inspiration when they're practicing on a daily level it's not that, that it's their first inspiration the first inspiration should be just or can be just looking around and seeing what's happening with the natural world but what could then flow from within to keep us energized to help us not give up well Things like Tara practice help with that. And then the other Tara, white Tara, uh, the one that's sitting in the full lotus position. And in some images of her, you would see that she's surrounded by six auras of different colors. So a six color rainbow uh, pavilion around her, essentially. Uh, when her practice is being done, there's a lot of meditations done specifically on inviting the properties of the five elements to rebalance them in our own body. White Tara practice is often done for healing and for longevity or to create positive conditions that would support healing and longevity. And at least in terms of changing our thinking, right? And our behavior and our habits. Uh, so within that, when we're meditating on connecting to the majestic mountains of this world, when we're meditating on connecting to you know the great rivers and the oceans and the fiery volcanoes and so forth once again we develop a certain sense of sacredness of the natural world 
which is a very powerful and important element of environmental thinking that the humanity has, according to Karen Armstrong, who we will quote later, is largely lost due to multiple cultural and historic reasons, but the humanity desperately needs to regain, at least to a certain degree, so that there is a greater level of planetary environmental well-being, if we're after that. And finally, pure land practice, not at all uniquely Tibetan. It is a powerful system of practice that is also applied in China, Japan, Vietnam, Korea, these days all across the world. But Indo Tibetan Buddhism has its own tradition of pure land practice and practice centered around the idea of a pure dimension that we might <laughs> eventually be reincarnated in to continue our practice, but that we can also at the same time to a certain degree embody right now in how we deal with the rest of the world, with other beings, with ourselves, and so forth. Pure land practice has a lot of, once again, environmentally related imagery, imagery related to the natural world that is inspiring uh, us to take good care of this natural world. If we're planning to be reborn in a pure land that is full of natural beauty, and we have some way of preserving the natural beauty that's already here, if we have some way if we have a way to affect the interdependence around us, to make the environment better preserved, to make the social dynamics more equitable and less violent, etc., that's what we could, can, should, might, must do if we go deeply into this pure land practice. And once again, the idea there is for us to be inspired by the idea of pure lands and the key figures in those pure lands and so forth, so that from within our basic goodness, there is a flow of positive qualities and positive activity. The activity that would be quite validly interpreted as us being servants to other beings, uh, servants to the world, uh, beings who serve beings from the point of view of social justice and environmental justice and all those sorts of things. So beautiful. Uh, and absolutely rich in terms of environmental ideas. But in a, another idea or another point that's fairly simple, and this would, of course, be very familiar already to people who have been attending events, especially with the San Francisco Dharma Collective, is that, is that there's incredible richness to the textual traditions of the Pali Canon, of the Sanskrit uh, tradition that has the Tibetan Canon and the Chinese Canon, those were translated into some languages and so forth. So this is an incredible textual richness to, for example, Buddhism. And quite a lot of Buddhist texts can be read through the lens of environmental ideas. In the same way that quite a lot of Buddhist texts can be read through the lens of queer Dharma. That is challenging the limiting ideas and principles of simply uh, patriarchal heteronormativity. So there's a number of lenses that we could put in front of our eye before we read those texts, and we would actually see them with greater clarity, and we would see a certain facet of those texts because they're very rich, very elaborate, and they can be read in a billion different ways. But those readings, those types of perception would not be invalid. So and the lens of environmentalism is one of the lenses through which we can find inspiration in many of these traditional types of writing. And that would in no way mean that these texts, for example, the sutras, uh, or in some cases also the tantras, or the great treatises, Indian treatises called the shastras, and then the Tibetan compositions, it would no, in no way mean that those texts are simply on environmentalism. They're not. They're also about how to get enlightened and or many other topics, some of them are on Tibetan medicine or other types of medical interventions. Some of them are about mental well-being or psychology or the composition of the universe or philosophy or ethics or just good sense, common sense advice in some cases. All of that would be valid. Those are the general topics, but collections of good advice or books on philosophy or books on ethics and so forth would include ideas that are directly pertinent to the idea of ideas of equidharma. So then the question is, what is equidharma? How can we interpret that word? And quite interestingly, a lot of the writing on equidharma, including equidharma, the book by David Loy, they don't really spend much time commenting on the term itself. 
and go straight into battle, straight into the issues that Ekodharma is supposed to tackle. But having been primarily trained in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, I can say that Indo-Tibetan tradition especially loves definitions and number lists. And as many, there are some friends who I've known for quite a while present here, and they have heard me uh, use this joke about a billion times. And it's a joke that's not my joke. I've heard it from someone. The joke is that Christians love God and Buddhists love numbered lists. And it's very true, and it's especially true in the context of the Indo-Tibetan tradition. Nothing that we as followers of that tradition love more than a good definition and a good numbered list. And there's about 800 of those numbered lists, at least. But actually, each one of them is so helpful for practice. So we will mention some in this meeting, and we will mention some more in the two ensuing ones. But to go back to the definitions... The root echo, quite familiar to us from such words as ecology and economy, comes from French, which comes from Latin, which presumably comes from Greek, oikos, which just means home or house. And so we have economy as the science of good housekeeping. That's essentially what it is, economy. It's just initially we did housekeeping within the confines of our own home, and now we're trying to figure out how to manage the home of our country and the home of the entirety of the planet with all the flows and uh, of money, resources, capital, and other things of that nature. So that's economy. And ecology, using the same root, looks at the home of the natural world that we're finding ourselves in, and it's trying to understand how to understand this home and preserve this home. So ecology has an, uh, a level which is descriptive and a level that is prescriptive and that is, is just trying to tell us how to survive and how to make sure the planet survives, which for some of us, there would be different emphasis on what's more important. Some people, like some billionaires, are super obsessed with sending people to Mars because they think the most important thing to make sure uh, survives is the human genome. You know, we've been so wonderful to this planet. Let's make sure we're spreading across multiple other planets and to hell with this one. So there is a famous person doing exactly that and not spending a penny on the actual environmental preservation, which maybe would be a wonderful thing to explore. And then there are some people, by contrast, who think, yeah, humanity is kind of a failed experiment, you know, we've really treated this planet horribly. So even if we don't survive, let's say another pandemic comes and we're all wiped out somehow, or I don't know, the artificial intelligence uh, becomes self-conscious tomorrow and decides that we are the mistake. No, no, whatever. All of these apocalyptic scenarios. So some people say, yeah, well, whatever. But there still will be trees and flowers and, you know, tigers and all these other expressions of the beauty of nature, even with humanity gone. And maybe that's that's maybe that's for the best, you know. So some people think that way. And then finally, in a very Buddhist way, Buddhism has the wonderful idea of the middle way. Identify two extremes, slip between them. So that's a kind of an epistemological principle. So the middle ground here is to think: what if we tried to make sure humanity and the planet survive together. Wouldn't that be good ecology and good economy and just good common sense thinking? What if we try to make sure both survive in a harmonious manner and if possible, whatever things in nature have been thus destroyed, we restore them to a certain level of equilibrium and then enhance that equilibrium so that there is once again a flourishing of the natural environment. So that that's what refers to oikos, home or house, the natural world. And then the word dharma is quite intriguing in that we can really contemplate it a lot and have multiple ideas about it. But what's really important is that even returning to the term itself can be a powerful source of inspiration in our practice. So some people would know that in the Tibetan tradition, uh, a term often mentioned in the traditional texts on this um, topic, which is defining the dharma, uh, what's often mentioned is that the word dharma itself in Sanskrit had at least 10 distinct meanings, possibly more. 
And we have seen different interpretations of it or translations of it across uh, late 19th, early 20th, and actually 20th century, where some people would translate Dharma as law. Some people would translate Dharma as teaching or principle or truth. And these are all correct. In a way, there are some of these 10 meanings, but the actual, uh, ver the actual uh, root of the Sanskrit term, dr, implies holding something, to hold something. So when dharma is used with a small d, and in that case it means phenomenon, phenomenon is described as that which holds its properties, its characteristics, its traits. That makes sense. Phenomenon is something that holds its own characteristic. Okay, good. And when we're talking about dharma with a capital D, like we are in this case, dharma is described as that which keeps us away, holds us away from suffering. That's the literal etymological meaning there, uh, if we interpret it on the basis of the uh, Sanskrit root. Okay, so something that would hold us away from suffering. So then ekodharma is something that holds us back from environmental suffering, suffering related to the natural environment in which we're finding ourselves and which we're quite unaware about in terms of how to keep it balanced and clean and pure and all those sorts of things. And then there's another definition here on the slide from the wonderful Geshe Nawang Dargi, who was one of the first Tibetan teachers to instruct Westerners in the Library for Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamsala when that was first created by the Dalai Lama in the 60s. And then he taught across the world, I think, a bit in Australia and a bit in other countries. But he was the, one of the first teachers for many, many renowned uh, first-generation Buddhist teachers in the United States, amongst other places. So he used to say, and that's a quote that Alan Wallace often repeats, Dharma is a way of viewing reality, a way of engaging with reality that brings a lasting and meaningful sense of well-being. So then ekodharma would be specifically a subset of that, a subcategory within that, that teaches us to view the natural reality that teaches us to engage with the natural reality in a way that brings a lasting and meaningful sense of well-being. And then very simply, the question is, on the basis of these two things, is, okay, what in my life already is ekodharma? What in my life, and maybe in my contemplative life, maybe I'm already doing a billion different practices, but what in my life, including my contemplative life, life sorry, is already keeping me away from environmental suffering, suffering related to the natural world and its destruction in particular. Because in this day and age, our environmental suffering is less about tigers trying to catch us or bitter frost destroying our harvest and therefore we have all died from hunger. It's less about that. And though, although we are experiencing a lot of natural disasters as a species to this day, quite a few of those are entering the category of man-made, caused by humanity by upsetting the systems of, for example, climate uh, redistribution and so forth. So because of that, it's more those types of suffering related to the environment that we start focusing on, and we can and should, kind of between us. And then the same with the first definition. What ways of viewing the natural reality and engaging with the natural reality I already have that would be bringing me a lasting and meaningful sense of well-being? It's a good question to contemplate because when we start that asking ourselves that question, we might discover that there's already so much that we're doing in this domain. So then we are not at all new to the concept of ekodharma or at least the practice of ekodharma. The word itself might be new. It's a subcategory of capital D Dharma in general. But then we might actually already be doing a lot of stuff that brings us genuine sense of well-being and helps us to engage with the natural world skillfully. But maybe also not. Maybe we discover that, oh, there's a lot of missing from my practice. And this is where I would like to have some ideas on how to practice psychodharma to establish a genuine sense of well-being. So it is in the domain of what type of well-being we are trying to establish and what level of reality are we working with 
that we can find the three planes of Ekadharma, the three layers of levels. So the first one that we're going to briefly talk about in this one, this meeting, is the personal level. Then we will progress to the relational level in the next meeting, and that includes both human relationships and relationships amongst human communities, and that includes issues of justice, environmental justice, food justice, and all those sorts of things. That's quite important, but also the healthy dynamics within a particular group or within a family, or within a couple. That's all also, in a way, ecology. It's about oikos, home. And then beyond that, we finally move on to the global area, which is where we offer service to the natural world. We're trying to protect it. We're trying to establish uh, fair and reasonable legislation when that's available to us. We're trying to create entities that we'd be protecting the environment and all of that. So environmental activism ar arises sort of or comes into the fray, comes into our perception at that level. But it starts deep within at the personal level, because it all needs to unfold from having an intention, a vision, a strategy, some inner resources, amongst other things. And that's what we're going to think about first. So th this is a question more for journaling uh, than for necessary exploring right now. But nonetheless, a question that might be interesting, and that is, what are your inspiration, aspirations right now, now that we have discussed all of this? related to the home that we have in the natural world or the, na in the natural world as our home. So what would be some of the personal aspirations for me right now? And when asking myself this question right now, I know that it doesn't have to be fancy, I answer, because some of it is just looking at more flowers outside right now. Suburban London is quite beautiful. It's a lot of flowers that are coming up. And so just connecting to that more deeply, spending more time now that it's getting finally, finally getting a bit warmer, spending more time with that, allowing myself to open up to that, to absorb this beauty while it's still here, to be energized by this beauty, to allow this beauty to transform my contemplative practice, to bring the greater sense of inner well-being. That's one of my aspirations right now. But beyond that, I want to understand more about things like uh, always always relevant recycling and so forth i want to know more about local initiatives in the domain of environmental protection i want to know more about what different buddhist communities in this country are doing related to ecodharma and so forth and those are also parts of my aspiration but what comes to mind first might not be this necessarily the most fancy or long reaching and so forth and that's also valid as long as there's something we're just starting the ball rolling. We're pushing the ball, letting it roll. We're exploring different ideas. And we just keep growing over time. So one idea. No. Oh, so, uh, so an observation in the chat, spend more time in natural environments. Yeah, there we go. And be consistent with my sustainable consumption habits. So that's in a way where we start, right? That's already the personal level that we're exploring. But in a way, there's more. So let's uh, just look at, look at this personal personal plane a bit more deeply uh, and don't have that much time left, but we'll start planting some seeds and then we'll continue uh, next time uh, in exactly one month. So first of all, uh, just a very brief overview of some ideas that probably already be familiar to you from Buddhism or other philosophical traditions. They are also common to Stoicism, uh, common to some types of Greek philosophy, and I think in a way universal. Uh, just this basic definition, once again, a definition straight from Buddhism of happiness, which says that happiness is a state that we want to extend what it is experienced or to evoke when it is not currently present. And that can include the happiness of spending time in wonderful company, like I am right now. Uh, or it can be the happiness of eating ice cream. Or it can be the happiness of full enlightenment and the bliss of that if we ever get to that point. Well, well, we will. Robert Thurman always says, enlightenment is inevitable. So we definitely will. Maybe it's three billion lives from now, or maybe three years from now. Who knows? It's different for all of us. But we will get there. But for now, it's more about the happiness of good company, or good ice cream, or looking at flowers, or sitting under a tree, or, you know. All those wonderful different things. Relational, personal, 
triggered by something, not triggered by something. But this is where we can think about different level, levels and layers of happiness. So a personal happiness, communal happiness, global happiness, there's research and all those things, right? We're thinking we have we're seeing research being done on, for example, how happy people in a particular country or in a particular social group are, how they rate their well-being. And as I keep <laughs> repeating over the last few weeks, according to a recent research done on internet-enabled populations, the country in which I'm currently finding myself very gratefully, the United Kingdom is in the last place in terms of inner, the sense, the subjective sense of inner well-being. Um, second to that is South Africa, and quite high on, the, on, on, on that rating, quite high on that list is Latin America, because people enjoy a greater sense, according to their own observations, much greater sense of connection to others, family, familial connections, community connections, and so forth, a very important factor to counteract our sense of isolation and therefore suffering. So thinking, what is my personal happiness? What is communal happiness? What's global happiness? Those are very valid questions. And another way to think about happiness is to think of it in terms of triggered by something on the outside or hedonic and brought in from the inside or eudaimonic. Eudaimonic well-being is here described as well-being that stems from within, from the configuration, I beg your pardon, from the configuration of our mind, how it is, my, our mind currently operates, works. Is it balanced? Are all the positive qualities in it fully developed? Are all the systems and functions operating as necessary? Is our attention well-trained? Is our loving kindness strong? Is our common sense or wisdom powerfully present? Yada, yada, yada. All of that is described as this inner well-being, which stays with us even when we are forced to face negative circumstances. And I'm not even going to quote any of my problematic experiences over the last couple of years, because we have all lived through the pandemic right now, right? We have all lived through multiple personal dramas and health scares, losing our jobs, losing our relationships, losing loved ones, just like we've lived through so much. And if we have survived, the source of our resilience, apart from the support we receive from our communities and so forth, was that seed of eudaimonia, eudaimonic well-being. And if we nurture that seed, we become very blissful at all times. We become those jovial, sunshine-like people who radiate well-being, even when they're, for example, sick in terms of their body. So we might have seen people like that. I definitely know quite a few of those, having met so many yogis and yoginis across the Indo-Tibetan tradition and some other traditions as well. So that's something we can cultivate. And this is where the natural world can support us. Even if we're simply following the same logic of cultivating eudaimonic well-being that we've already voiced. So Buddha's working hypothesis for cultivating personal happiness with regards to the inner plane, not, not how to get money, not how to find a job or get more followers on Instagram, but in terms of how to cultivate the inner well-being, the working hypothesis of the Buddha is that we need three components at least. We start with ethical practice. And that already brings us a certain level of psychological well-being, sometimes referred to in these traditions as the happiness of blamelessness, or basically good, good conscience, like clear conscience, knowing that we've done our best, and we're really trying to adjust our ethical behavior at all times. And then we see that we have this blind spot, and we adjust that as well. And then we see that we have been culturally insensitive, and we adjust that as well. And then we catch ourselves being slightly offensive because we have just simply didn't know better. And then we adjust that as well. And at the end of the day, we're feeling good about ourselves because we really are making the effort to be kind and nonviolent. So that's the first level of practice, Buddha says. Then come practices for mental composure, different concentration techniques, meditations on loving kindness and on compassion, mindfulness practices of different kinds what's called shamatha or attentional training in Buddhism, all of those together, meant to purify the flow of our mental energy and to, therapeutically to heal us, actually, so that that mental energy flows like a beautiful, shining river of gold and not like all over the place, barely clear, with barely any clarity, horrible, smelly, stinky, which is kind of how I would describe my, my mind oftentimes. Uh, at least in the moments when I'm not actively training in samadhi, not trying to purify that flow. And then once that flow is powerful and strong, 
and, or maybe especially strong, like a laser. That's a modern day comparison, obviously. We use the third practice, and that's the practice for knowing the nature of reality as it is, discerning the nature of reality as it is, using an incredible function of our mind that in Buddhist psychology is called discerning intelligence or discerning awareness of prajna or pragya, different ways of pronouncing it. That is our ability to know the difference between objects and see how a particular object has different qualities to it. But then here directed to the true nature of our mind or the true nature of our person or the true nature of all phenomena, once again, different strategies, so that we can experience them one Saint Augustine referred to as the happiness of knowing the truth, the bliss of knowing the truth. And that's exactly what we see in all these amazing Buddhist biographies where someone is practicing with a koan for 10 years or meditating on uh, analytical practices or trying to understand what is emptiness, what is this emptiness that everyone's talking about. And then they experience a breakthrough and then suddenly they're very, very, very happy. And that happiness is irreverse, irreversible. They're super happy, and they remain that level of happy. And then if they continue practicing, they become even more happy. So that's what's intriguing. And that was what was intriguing to so many people in the 60s when they were starting to bring these ideas to California, amongst <laughs> other places. What, they were, what were they inspired by? They've met some masters, or at least they've read about some masters, who have gone to this happiness of knowing the truth. Okay, that's inspiring. Where does the natural world fit in? Well, that's, these are the questions here. Can these three aspects be used within the context of our relationship with nature? Right? Or can they be practiced outside of the context? To be very brief, I would say that the answer to the second one is no. They can be practiced outside of that context. Because I, I guess unless we do fly to Mars, together with that famous, quite problematic billionaire, or unless we go into bunkers, 40 levels under the ground, which a lot of billionaires have also built for themselves. It's truly fascinating. The interviews with the people who were building those bunkers for them. It's just, hmm, why not spend that money on protecting the environment? You know. But um, be that as it may, unless we do something of that uh, effect, for most of us, we do meditation within natural environment. I mean, we can be doing it in our bedroom, but we step outside and it's that climate, it's those trees, it's those mountains, the streams of water. So it's all right there. And as I have mentioned before, when we're practicing Shila, we do in this day and age inevitably factor in our sustainable sustainability of our behavior and our behavior towards nature. Okay. When we practice Samadhi or mental composure, we can use practices for focusing on the five elements. For example, mindfulness of breathing is actually an extension of practices of the practice for concentrating on the element of air. That's how it's historically described sometimes because air is movement. Air is what moves through us when we're breathing. That's what we're concentrating. So if all air is super polluted and poisonous, oof, it's not going to be much mindfulness of breathing. And then... Uh, at the same time, we need to be in a balanced natural environment if we want to succeed in this practice. Then prajna or discerning intelligence, these are practices for understanding interdependence. Well, isn't one of the first levels of interdependence that we operate on our interdependence with nature, interdependence between the natural elements, interdependence between the ecological situations in different countries, and then social interdependence, racial interdependence in terms of such things as race, sexual identity, gender identity, and so forth, legislation around all those things, cultural norms around all those things. These are examples of interdependence on a simple secular level that are graspable. We can understand them way before we go into the interdependence of what is, does it mean to have personhood what does it mean to have a mind? What does it mean to exist in this reality altogether? Okay, so natural world is implicated in all of that and affected by all of this if we use these three categories to practice eudaimonic well-being, cultivate the eudaimonic well-being, and make something of an echodharma practitioner of ourselves. So uh, just to summarize it in a very brief the Shila here would imply the ethics of nonviolence, but that includes nonviolence towards not just ourselves, 
because it's also nonviolence towards other types of beings, right? You can't be saying, oh, yes, I'm the greatest Shula practitioner in the world, and then go out and shoot a bunch of elephants and, you know, also a bunch of humans and then cut down a bunch of trees and burn them to the ground and stand there and laugh, which is actually what a lot of people surprisingly do, these kinds of things. But they probably wouldn't be able to claim that they're super successful in this level of practice. And they're probably not experiencing, that's a working hypothesis, the happiness of blamelessness, even if they're super brazen about what they're doing. So that's something to experiment with, obviously, not by killing a bunch of animals, but by trying to strengthen our nonviolent behavior. Then for samadhi, we can be focusing our um, awareness, or awareness on something that is natural, or there's even a practice, and that's what we're going to conclude with as an idea for the sunny day. I'm here. It's good and pleasant in California today, and it's pleasant in some other locations that some people are joining from. So that's something of an idea for practice today, right? There's just simply a practice of resting in naturalness, and that is we go outside to whatever natural location that we're finding ourselves in. We allow our body, our speech, and our mind to simply rest in inactivity. Tenzin Wangal Rinpoche describes that as the union of three pills, he calls it, addressing Americans. That's why he came up with the idea of pills. Stillness, silence, and spaciousness. He uses the wording of pills according to him because Westerners love pills. So when he talks about pills, they memorize the name, and then it becomes easy for them to apply these. They are also pills because they are a medicine for neurotic patterns of physical behavior, verbal behavior, and mental behavior. So what are the pills? Let your body be still. Let your speech be silent. Let your mind be spacious. That is not fully fused with individual thoughts and emotions and so forth, but rather openly spacious and radiant. So quite simple, not easy to accomplish, but quite simple in terms of what we have to do. Starting with stillness, just being aware of the stillness, relaxing the body, and just being in that natural environment. So from the point of view of these traditions, actually, when we do just that, and that's a practice of concentration, essentially, the positive effect of the five elements around us would start flowing into our system. It would start affecting our physical health and our mental health. And actually, uh, Yves Ekman, way more than me, knows a lot about uh, the positive effect of being in contact with nature. There's some studies on that, and according to those studies, we receive that benefit even if we watch natural images on a computer screen, for example, because it kind of tricks our brain a little bit. But beyond that, of course, all the more energy if we are actually in a beautiful forest environment, but even more energy if we allow ourselves to be still with it, so that something can flow into that still cup that we become, that still vase. We're inactive. And therefore, we're receptive. And that's where the magic starts to happen. And then on the level of prajna, looking deeply into the interdependence network of existence. So simply asking ourselves, hey, isn't it powerful how deeply I am connected to others, to the natural world, to other species, to those flowers outside on London streets? Isn't that powerful how just seeing those flowers gives me such a pleasant type of stimulation? and motivates me to try and do my best to make sure that these flowers still exist 50 years from now. Now, those individual ones, but just in general, there's still something biologically alive here on this planet. Powerful. But beyond that, I can also see in them a symbol of eudaimonic well-being. That's why we use them as symbols. So that's why in Buddhism, everyone's sitting on a lotus flower all the time. Not because of its magical properties or not because it smells good, but because it's such a powerful symbol of flourishing, uncovering, opening, revealing the potential. And, okay, let me preserve those symbols. So that's one thing that might arise. And so in a similar manner, um, when talking about personal well-being, the traditional medical systems of China, Tibet, India, and I'm sure a number of other countries. And that's all, Tibetan medicine is also practiced across the Himalayan region and the Mongolian region. Um, they have a very holistic view, uh, practitioners of these medical systems, of what health is. And I describe health as a state of balance between the five elements and between the three humors of wind, bile, and phlegm. 
But even if we're just focused on the five elements, what is health? Would we ask such a doctor? And a doctor would say, when your five elements are balanced and working properly, that's when you receive that thing called health and your body feels good. And it can do all sorts of things like walk when you need it to walk, sleep when you need it to sleep. It's not awake when you need it to sleep. It's not, in, it's not without energy when you need it to work and so forth because everything is balanced. So uh, the Equidharma principle to apply here is balancing, bringing the elements to balance and developing an appreciation of the elements that we're made up of. So some practitioners here employ meditations for uh, connecting to the five elements that the body is made of. And then special methods, practices, medical intervention, and so forth to rebalance the elements. But it also includes, for example, our dietary decisions, our habits with regards to exercise, using special types of bodily movement to rebalance the five elements of the body and so forth. That's all included in the domain of echodharma, implicitly present in it, even if we personally are not particularly interested in that. Some people would be super passionate about these, some not. It's just important to say that these methods are present and transmitted and still alive, and they do also fall under the subset of Ekodharma. So uh, one of almost concluding note here is that whether we use these methods for balancing the elements, we meditate on the elements consciously or not, uh, whatever our personal aspirations with regards to flowers outside uh, are, one key element that keeps resurfacing in different uh, books on Ekodharma, articles on Ekodharma, and also traditional teachings related to the natural world is how important it is to have a sense of sacredness or appreciation towards the natural world and how important it is to therefore use special methods for cultivating that. So for cultural background, we can say that there's been an erosion of this feeling that the natural world, or the elements it's made of, is sacred. It happened for multiple reasons. There was a certain level of effect coming from the side of the Abrahamic traditions, and then the, a, lot of effect, a lot of stuff happening from the side of secularism, atheism, materialism, and so forth. But regardless of who is particularly to blame, and Carl Armstrong has a whole research on who is particularly or theoretically to blame, which is not as important as what do we do then. But whoever it is, however we might ascribe the blame to, the important point is that it seems that the sacred sacredness is important for two reasons. One is that when we feel the natural world is sacred in a way or super important, super valuable, we will try to protect it. We will be less greedy while destroying it and so forth. And that's one element. Another element is that it seems that's... A, point that Tenzin Wangel Rinpoche brings up in his book on the elements, but I think it's also a very interesting idea to explore, is that unless we actually have a sense of sacredness towards something, our psyche is not receiving all the types of support it needs to flourish. So if we have zero sense of sacredness towards anything, and that doesn't necessarily have to be natural world, some people feel super um sacred or the people feel that for example something related to god is super sacred right that's a feeling of sacredness or family values might be sacred for them or history communism might be sacred for some people and it was over the course of soviet history but the point of it, the point is that there needs to be some sac sense of sacredness and if that is missing altogether our mind is losing very important sources of support and then it kind of goes out of balance slowly slowly so to avoid that, Buddhism suggests that we do some practices related to the mental function or factor of appreciation. And that's a specific aspect of our psychology, Mopa in Tibetan, our ability to appreciate the value, the sacredness, the importance of something. Very, very important practice and a very, very important function in Tibetan Buddhist practice. And it's specifically using this thing called Mopa, appreciation. It's specifically by using that that we do invite the inspiration from our lineage is land lineage, spiritual lineage, our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors, all of those sorts of things. They happen through the application of this mental function, this mental factor. So in the same way, here we have an open invitation to gradually cultivate these gentle glimpses of awe towards the natural world. And here's 
how uh, Karen Armstrong uh, ooh, ooh, describes it in her recent book, Sacred Nature. And that's exactly uh, the book on this loss of the sense of sacredness and then potentially regaining it uh, that she released uh, last year. Uh, and Karen Armstrong, for those of you who have don't know, is a very famous historian of religions. Uh, she not only wrote multiple wonderful books about history of the concept of God and history of fundamentalism and such things, or history of Jerusalem. Um, she has wonderful biographies on both, both Muhammad and the Buddha. But she is particularly known for her TED award-winning work on compassion. She wrote a wonderful book on the history of compassion and the importance of compassion called 12 Steps to Compassionate Living. And her most recent work is on nature, or ekodharma, essentially. So here she says, and that might be our invitation for this rest of the day or for the rest of our life if we want, but something to experiment with. She says, we can begin, begin the process of regaining the sense of sacredness by taking simple steps, perhaps sitting in a garden or a park or 10 minutes a day without headphones or a mobile phone, simply registering the sights and sounds of nature. Instead of taking photographs of our surroundings, we should look at the birds, flowers, clouds, and trees and let them impress themselves on our minds. In another of his poems, Wordsworth speaks of the wise passiveness that should inform our dealings with nature. So wise passiveness is quite similar to what Tenzin Wangari Bache describes as the three pills of stillness, silence, and spaciousness, right? It's not simply turning our mind off. It's consciously resting in a still, silent, and spacious state. He is arguing with somebody who has his nose in the book all the time, blocking out all the sights and sounds of the natural world. It is hard to imagine what he would have thought of our technology today. And I know it's different for all of us because some are very much in contact with nature at all times and actually spend very little time in their devices. And if that's the category I belong to, I'm super grateful that you're taking this time to join us uh, in the Zoom session. But if you do feel like you could enjoy a greater sense of contact with nature and therefore also strengthen the mental factor of appreciation towards it. That in itself is an interesting and powerful source of well-being that would inform our practices of Srila Samadhi and Prajna, ethical self-discipline, mental gathering and composure, and cultivation of wisdom, especially with regards to interdependence. So from my side, that's the idea for today. That's the inspiration. That's something we can experiment with and then discuss in our meeting next time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Otherwise, I would suggest we all go out, if, if available to us, and sit on a bench and do exactly what Karen Armstrong and Wordsworth and multiple Buddhist teachers are inviting us to do. So that could be a fun experiment. Yeah, That's all from me. So thank you so much for joining us today. And once again, if you have an urgent question, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll just wrap it up and we'll go watch birds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining. Uh, my deepest gratitude to Cage for hosting us today and for inviting me and organizing this session. So from my side, I'm just very much hoping to see you all uh, next time, if you have some time, or there would also be a recording. So yeah, enjoy the exploration, and I hope some of it was of benefit. Thank you so much.